So I'd like to say thank everybody for coming to the fourth Unpacking Masculinity series. I'm here with Dr. Michael Flood. We are super, super excited to have him. Um, we're going to talk about the breaking out of band box, and we're very, very excited. I just before we start, I want to do a quick lab recognition. Can I just get a thumbs up from the audience or anybody to see if I can, if I can, um, if everybody can hear me very well, or if I'm having a good, bad, good? Awesome. Good, good, good. That was amazing. Was, was good. These headphones aren't aren't the best. <laughs> So the Unpacking Math Grandly Speaker Series honors and acknowledges that we are in Medicine Hat, Alberta, and are situated in Treaty 7 and neighbor to Treaty 4 territory. Churchill lands of the Sikasa, Blackfoot, Kainai, Flood, and Tikan, Paji, and Sony Nakoda, and Tuscany, as well as the Treaty Six and Sokwa Bands and the Jewe people. I'm hoping I'm not pronouncing any of those names wrong, but I guess. <laughs> We also honor the knowledge that we are on the homeland of Métis Nation and within the region um, free. Um, so everybody in the audience, the U.S. microphone and the camera will be disconnected. Um, just avoid any, any interruption on background noises or any unintentional um, noises we get back and rise throughout the event. Um, and this recording will also be uh, recorded. So if you have to scoot out for any means, that's okay. It'll be uploaded to Sark's YouTube channel um, in the next coming weeks. So this also this presentation will be a roughly about 90 minutes long max. And if you have to go for any reason, that's totally fine. We, we get it, life happens. It's a, it's a Sunday, maybe you have to do Sunday, <laughs> Sunday things. I know Mikey said it's Monday with you, so. <laughs> Maybe it's a different day wherever you are situated. All righty. So, Michael Flood. Sorry, look, um, thank you everybody for joining us on your Sunday, my Monday. In fact, uh, I confess it's four o'clock in the morning on um, Monday morning here. So, if I'm a little bleary eyed, that's what's going on and you, you'll probably see the sun in fact i don't think you'll see the sun come up it'll still be dark when we're done this morning um anyway um so uh before i start i wanted to thank next gen men and the southeastern alberta sexual assault response committee for hosting me and as is the custom in australia too i will acknowledge the terrible and jugara people uh the relevant indigenous um, communities as the first nation owners of the lands on which i'm sitting and pay respects to their elders laws and customs so today I'm going to uh, really explore the notion of the man box, the notion that men's lives and boys' lives are shaped by uh, expectations about manhood. I'm going to look at how that plays out in boys' and men's lives, and I'm going to look at what we can do about that, the ways we can challenge that, the ways we can sort of open up the possibilities for what it means to be a man. And um, I'm going to start with gender, and this may be material that's been covered uh, before in the Unpacking Masculinity series, I'm not sure, um, but we'll see how we go. And I'll move through some of this fairly quickly because some of it you'll know, uh, more, some of it I'll spend more time on. And I'm going to share my slides if I can. So let's see if we can do that now. Uh, sorry, that's what I want to do. Share screen, there we are. Okay, um, and just let me know straight away if the um, slide um, sharing is not working. So, um, okay, so let's start with the notion of gender. Well, actually, before we talk about gender in general, one thing to notice is men and masculinities are on the agenda. There's growing attention to the attitudes, the practices, the relations associated with men and boys um, and their implications, their implications for health, their implications for violence, for gender inequality. And we see this in media discussion of toxic masculinity, controversies over the Gillette ad and the APA guidelines and working with men and boys, uh, growing body of scholarship on men and masculinities and uh, health promotion and community work uh, aimed at men and boys. In other words, men and masculinities are on the agenda. 
So let's talk about the notion of gender itself. And I use a very simple definition, well, I hope it's a simple definition, that gender refers to the meanings we give to being male and female and the social organisation of men's and women's lives. Now, um, community understandings and other understandings of gender have shifted radically in the last decade or so, and there's a growing focus on notions of gender identity. But I would argue that's only one part of what gender is. Gender refers, yes, to notions of identity, but it also refers to the behaviours and the practices and the relationships that uh, men and women are meant to adopt. It refers to the images and the representations of women and men out in the world. It refers to the meanings we give to biological categories of male and female and, you know, the fact of intersex. And it refers to how men's and women's lives are organised uh, in work, in sport, in leisure um, and so on. And so the point I want to make here is that men's and boys' lives are shaped just as much as, as women's and girls are by gender. Gender's often historically been code for women. It's a gender issue. It means it's an issue specifically of concern to women. But in fact, men too are gendered, uh, gender beings who participate in gender relations. So for example, you know, when we tell boys to be strong or to stop crying like a little girl, we are teaching them about gender. When we allow girls to be afraid, but we encourage boys to be tough and brave, we're teaching about gender. When we turn a blind eye to violence between males, saying boys will be boys, again, we're teaching about gender. When um, religious institutions uh, offer particular ideas about gender roles and the appropriateness of men's and women's roles, they are helping to construct gender. When governments make policies about parenting and family law and parental leave, again, they are shaping gender. So men's and women's lives are gendered and gender means men and women, uh, sorry, uh, means boys and men as much as it mean, means girls and women. So when I use the term masculinity today, I'm um, using that same definition. Masculinity refers to the meanings given to being male and the social organisation of men's and boys' lives. Um, Okay, now um, a second point to make is that the patterns of gender we see, the patterns of men's and women's lives we see are very much the product of society. They're not the simple and inevitable, inevitable outcome of biology or testosterone or hormones or brain structure. Instead, they are shaped in society. And you know, two compelling forms of evidence that that's the case, that gender is socially constructed, to use that language, Two compelling forms of evidence are that are uh, one, the fact that gender roles and relations differ over time. Look back in history and we see radically different arrangements of men's and women's lives, different expectations about how men and women should behave. Second, look in cultures across the world now, look cross-culturally, and again, we see difference, we see diversity. Whereas if gender were the simple product of biology, you would expect to see much more um, sameness, much more homogeneity. The most well-documented example we have of how gender is socially constructed is to do with the socialization of children, the socialization of children into gender roles. And we have a wealth of uh, research documenting that parents and other adults treat children differently depending on whether they perceive those children to be boys or girls um, and systematically shape children um, in different ways, depending on their perceived sex. And what you end up with then is boys and girls who have different interests, different skills, different orientations and so on. But gender is not simply a function of uh, parental socialization and how children are raised. Gender is embedded in every aspect of social life. Gender is embedded in popular culture and movies and TV. It's embedded in how our sporting institutions are organized. It's embedded in government policy. It's embedded in our workplaces, in who does what kind of work, in the ways that men interact with each other compared to how they interact with women and so on. So gender is everywhere. Doesn't mean that um, sexism and inequality are everywhere because so far how I've described gender is somewhat open-ended. There may be relatively fair, relative, relatively egalitarian gender roles, or there may be deeply unequal ones. It depends really. So 
Um, and so, you know, I've got a few slides that just show you some of the kind of images of masculinity that shape people's perceptions of what it means to be a man. You know, one dominant perception, one dominant image is of the murderous hero, you know, the John Wicks character, someone who exacts violent, bloody revenge um, in the name of justice or indeed in the name of injustice or, or whatever. Um, word clouds of boys' toys, of how um, toys that are advertised to boys and what kinds of qualities those toys show, again, show themes that, you know, start to be familiar, that to be a boy is to be confident, to be tough, to be strong, and so on. And, you know, uh, this very simplistic slide uh, gives you, you know, a very kind of simple account of some of the typical gender norms that boys and girls have been raised to live up to that boys are expected to be masculine, obviously, to be tough, to be aggressive, to be in control, to be daring, to be dominant, and so on. Um, and in fact, one thing I would say is those norms are shifting. Some of those qualities are breaking down, or at least there's a greater sharing of those qualities um, with girls and women. So in some ways, this is a dated list, but I still think that something like this is still going on in some ways. This is another version of this account, and this is the notion of the man box the notion that there are a set of qualities that are part of what uh, is expected of boys and men in many contexts, in many societies, um, and that boys and men are under pressure, under pressure to stay in the man box. And there's two kinds of pressure. On the one hand, there's punishment. Punishment if you step outside that box. And in Canada, as in Australia, in many countries, there are kind of typical ways that boys are pushed back into that box being told they're a fag or gay or a pussy or a girl. In other words, um, attacks on their masculinity and attacks on their heterosexuality. So one way that boys and men are pressured to stay in the box is through punishment. But the flip side of that is reward, that you get status. You get status among male peers, status among girls, status in your family, rewards, compliments, praise, and so on for doing well at stereotypically masculine qualities. Now, some of you may be thinking this is too simplistic, and it is, but I'm starting, I'm trying at this point to give you a sort of taste of how masculinity works. Um, so Rogers asked, why is this so much focus on the gender of a baby in utero? In fact, it's the sex of the baby in utero. Um, gender reveal parties, mistakenly called gender reveal parties, really they're sex reveal parties. They're does it have a penis or does it have a vulva parties? Pink versus look blue. Yeah, I think I actually think there's something interesting going on, Roger, where there's been growing attention to that. Um, if we look at, for example, toy stores, there's been a growing gender split in toy stores over the last 30 years where the degree of kind of gender specific marketing has increased um, in Western countries, whereas in some ways you might think it had decreased. Um, and that may represent a kind of defensive reassertion of gender because actual gender roles are blurring in some ways, are breaking down in some ways. I'm just going to close that and move on to the next slide. Now, this is a bit of an experiment. I can, I'm going to see if I can show you a video. Um, yeah, well, can I just click on this link? I'm going to, um, you shouldn't, you'll need sound for this. Um, so let's see if this works. So um, I'm going to press play on this YouTube video and we'll see if this works. I'm just going to check the chat uh, and close that. Okay. Is it okay to be skinny? <laughs> Is it okay to not like sports? Is it okay to be a virgin to experiment with other guys? Is it okay for guys to be nervous? To have long hair? To like guts? To take a selfie? To shave your to be depressed? Is it okay for me to be a little spoon? Go online to search and see for yourself. That was an ad from Axe. And Axe, historically, Axe markets cologne and other products to boys and men. Historically, Axe has used really kind of stereotypical appeals to men. Spray this cologne on and suddenly all these women in bikinis and lingerie will jump on you and find you intensely desirable. But Axe, like some other companies, like Gillette and others, has started to rethink how it markets to boys and men and has started to, if you like, kind of open up some of its images um, and its appeals. I'm going to show you one more ad and then we'll come back to some of these issues. 
masculine. Adjective. Having qualities or appearance traditionally associated with men, especially strength and aggressiveness. Some of the synonyms are macho, manly, muscular, <laughs> well-built, red-blooded. Red-blooded? My goodness. Strapping, strong, brawny, powerful. None of these really sound like me. <laughs> I think that definition is a little scary. It's too small for something so big. It's all about trying to get people to conform and be a certain way. I think that's what gets us in trouble is when we say that there's only one way to be a man. So many individuals, they try and fit, and it just gets to a point where it's too much. Where they are doing harm to each other and harm to themselves. You don't have to do that. You define your own masculinity. You define who you are. For me, being masculine is being honest. This is the body that I have. This is what I know. So to me, this is what a man is. For me, being masculine means being brave enough to be who I am. Being able to smile, being able to cry, being able to love and be loved. That's the man I want to be. What does it mean to me to be masculine? Um, it's more a question of what does it mean to be human? Um, okay, so, so both those ads are really, you know, talking about the messages we give about um, the messages we give men and the kind of opening up of those messages. Um, and um, I want to I want to talk about why it matters, why those messages matter. So let's talk about the impacts of conformity, the impacts of conformity to masculinity. If we look at the area of public health, the area of health promotion, trying to improve people's lives and well-being, what we see is growing recognition that those norms of masculinity, those expectations of masculinity have impacts. They have impacts on men's own health and well-being and the impact, oh, sorry, and the well-being of those around them. And in fact, there's now a wealth of research to show that conforming to traditional masculinity, conforming to that expectation that you be tough, you be strong, you be in control, you not show weakness and so on, is a risk factor, is a risk factor for various kinds of health issues, various kinds of social problems. And so we know, for example, that men who conform more strongly to those ideals of masculinity are more likely than other men to use violence, to use violence against women, to use violence against other men. They're more likely to consider suicide. They're more likely to take risks with sexual partners, to forego condom use or risk sexually transmitted infection and unwanted, uh, unwanted pregnancy. They're more likely to drive dangerously. They're more likely to avoid help seeking. Uh, they're, um, they're less likely to be involved fathers, to be active fathers. So we know that conformity to masculinity matters. It shapes men's and boys' lives in many ways that are negative, that are harmful. And I'll, um, and you know, I've described all these social problems that conformity to masculinity feeds into. Now I'm not saying gender explains all of those entirely. Gender is not the whole story. And each of those social problems is shaped by a range of other factors as well as conformity to masculinity. But gender is certainly part of the story. And I want to look in more detail at one example of that. And this is the survey that was done in Australia called the Manbox survey. And in fact, it was first done in North America. It was done not in Canada, but in the US, Mexico and UK um, by uh, Heilman and colleagues. And we then did the same survey in Australia. And I'll give you a sort of detailed example of this because it's a really kind of, um, I think a rich example of how young men's conformity to stereotypical ideas about manhood shapes their lives. So the setup was very simple, and this is what was done in the US as well. Um, uh, 17 statements, 17 statements expressing stereotypical or traditional views about being a man, about strength, about aggressiveness, about heterosexuality, about having lots of sexual partners, um, not doing the dishes, those kinds of things. And then um, a, a representative survey of young men, in this case, young men 18 to 30 in Australia, about, about their agreement with those messages. And they're asked two things. They're asked whether they personally agree with those messages. And they're also asked whether they felt that that's what they were told by society. Is this the messages they were told by society? And we also collected a whole lot of data on their own health and well-being their use of violence, their experience of violence as victims, um, 
their uh, relations with, uh, with women, uh, with men, their mental health, um, and so on. And what we found is that conformity to, well, actually, before we, before we talk about what um, impacts it had, I'll talk a bit about young men's attitudes. And I don't know how identical these would be among Canadian young men. In fact, I'll, um, we'll, we'll ask about this in a moment. But what, what in Australia we found is that young men um, definitely agreed that to be a man is to be strong, to be physically attractive, um, to, uh, to be the breadwinner, to be the one who earns money. Um, many young men felt that that's what they were told by society. Their own belief in those attitudes was lower. Their own belief that that's what they themselves should be was lower. And in fact, only about one third to half of young men personally agreed that being a man is about strength, control over women and so on. But um, half to two thirds felt, yes, that's what they were told by society. So there was a gap between what they themselves believed and what they felt they and other men were being told. Um, uh, let's have a look. Um, and so one thing that tells us is that large numbers of men actually have views that may not fit our stereotypes, our stereotypes of masculinity, of the norms that are out there, that we need good data. Uh, it was very troubling to find that about one third, sorry, one quarter to one third of young men in Australia felt, for example, that young men should have the final say in relationships or men should always know their girlfriend's movements at all times. Now that's about control, that's about power. And the fact that 27 or 37% of young men agreed with those was pretty troubling. But as I said, the man box work, and it's been done in other countries, the man box work also looked at the impact of agreeing with those traditional definitions of manhood. One thing we found was that young men who agreed with those definitions were more likely to suffer harm themselves, more likely to have felt depressed or suicidal in the last four weeks more likely to seek help only from a small number of sources, more likely to be drinking at risky levels, more likely to be involved in traffic accidents. So we documented the link between conformity to masculinity and harm to oneself, taking risks, neglecting one's health, um, and so on. We also documented a link between conformity to masculinity and harm to others. Young men who agreed more strongly with the man box ideals they were more likely to perpetrate sexual harassment. In fact, they were six times as likely as young men who didn't agree with the man box um, norms to perpetrate sexual harassment. They were more likely to bully, to bully others online, to use violence against other men face-to-face. Um, -face. And they were more likely to have used violence against women. Finally, they were less likely to have intervened, less likely to intervene when they saw someone else being violent. So what this, what this story tells us, and this is a story that's been played out in research around the world, that conformity to masculinity matters. It shapes uh, boys and adult men, not just young men, but men of all ages, um, how we live our lives in ways that can be limiting, that can be dangerous, that can be downright lethal, in fact, for us or others. Um, oh, we managed not to skip a slide. Sorry, so there it goes. There's, there's a slide summary that young men's research. Um, I'll just go over that, but I've done that. So I wanna ask you, um, so thinking about the men you know, in fact, maybe not the men you know, but the men, men in, your, in your community, in your country, how might their conformity to masculinity, to masculine norms, the norms I've talked about, be strong, be in control, don't show weakness and so on, how might those norms shape their involvement um, in these three areas, drinking alcohol, suicide, and responses to COVID-19. So um, I'm going to ask you to type if you've got a moment, because um, I don't think you we can hear you via audio. I think that's the case. Danica can tell me if that's not the case. But um, can people write into chat any thoughts you've got on how um, traditional masculinity or stereotypical masculinity might shape men's involvement in these three areas, alcohol, suicide, or responses to COVID-19? going to drink some of my tea. 
Great, we've got a whole stack of, stack of answers coming in. I was looking at the Q&A box, but I needed to be looking at the chat box. Um, so let's have a look. Um, great, okay, so there's some really interesting stuff here about um, drinking. Let's talk about drinking first. Um, so we know, for example, there is a pattern of, for example, young men drinking at riskier levels. So, you know, levels that the health organizations deem to be risky, much more commonly than, um, than young women. So young men's risky drinking tends to be frequent, tends to be at greater levels, um, and tends to, um, oh, I'm just trying to move this, there we go, sorry, I'm just trying to move my own notes, and tends to involve different kinds of alcohol as, as well. In fact, there's a kind of gendering to alcohol use where some drinks are seen as more appropriate for women than men. So in Australia, at least beer is more commonly drunk by men than women, wine is the reverse, um, although that gap is um, closing slightly. And um, look at alcohol-related injuries in hospital, for example, or other kinds of alcohol-related disease and injury, and it tends to be higher among men than women. And there's a body of research showing that one factor going on there is to do with masculinity, that men who agree more strongly with traditional masculinity are more likely to feel that they need to drink heavily. They need to drink heavily to kind of show that they can handle their drink, withstand the effects of alcohol consumption and so on. And then there's the way that drinking itself is socially organized, the actual ways that, excuse me, that people organize their, you know, their, their drinking itself. Um, let's see if anyone's commented on this. I'll come back to suicide in a moment. Um, and so, you know, certainly in Australia and I, you know, perhaps in Canada, one thing, one way that patterns of risky drinking work is large male groups, groups of men drinking at risky levels together where there's pressure on each other to drink and where drinking heavily, being intoxicated is a form of male bonding, a form of homosocials. So that's not homosexual, homosocial. So male, male social bonding. Okay, let's look at suicide. Um, so I'm just gonna have a look at the chat here. So we've got people suggesting that masculine norms might shape suicide in terms of you don't talk about it. You don't talk about the problems you're facing, the depression you're feeling. Um, you may consider suicide more quickly than others um, who conform less strongly to masculinity. They may be more willing to ask for help. They might, in fact, have stronger social networks around them. Um, what else we got? Um, okay, so um, again, there's research on this. We know that in Western countries, men's rates of completed suicide are about three times those of women. That's not the case globally. In some countries, it's roughly similar, but at least in Western countries, men's rates of suicide are two and a half to three times as high as women's. Women's rates of attempted suicide are higher, but that's a different matter. And we know that endorsement of traditional masculinity is a risk factor for suicidal thoughts and actual suicidal completion. So um, one thing that's going on here is that one traditional norm of masculinity is stoicism. Stoicism, the idea that you should take the pain, not show weakness, not reach out for help and so on. And uh, research has found um, associations between believing in that ideal, believing that men shouldn't show weakness, shouldn't show pain, and a greater likelihood of attempting suicide. Um, a large scale analysis in the US found that traditional masculinity was a risk factor for suicidal thoughts, second only to depression. So obviously mental health is a factor here, but mental health itself can be shaped by conformity to traditional masculinity. Um, and um, uh, so other research, yeah, various studies in, in Ireland, in Australia, um, in the US and elsewhere, find that conforming to traditional masculinity um, is a risk factor, a risk factor for suicidal thoughts, including the man box study that I mentioned before. And in fact, one of the most recent pieces of research that came out uh, just last year found um, that tracked groups of men over time found that in fact, young men, sorry, men with high traditional masculinity believed in aggressiveness, in emotional restriction, in competition, they were two and a half times as likely to die by suicide as other men. And this was the first study that looked at the impact of masculine norms on actual suicide deaths, not only men's attempts at suicide or thoughts of suicide, but actual suicide completions. And again, showed that masculinity was a factor. Um, not the only thing, but an important factor. Now, I don't have a slide on COVID, but there is certainly growing research on COVID and people have, let's have a look, 
I'm going to grab this chat. I'm working across multiple screens here, so this is slightly tricky. Um, mask wearing is a great example. Some evidence that um, mask wearing is lower among men who believe more strongly in notions of strength, notions of autonomy, and so on. And there's one thing that's interesting going on here, which is that one set of traditional masculine norms is about self-sacrifice, about self-sacrifice for the greater good, and about protecting others, protecting women, protecting children, protecting others who are weaker than yourself. Now, those masculine norms don't seem to be encouraging men's mask wearing. Instead, men's mask wearing is discouraged by other masculine norms, norms of toughness, norms of risk um, taking and so on. Now, I know that, again, mask wearing or not wearing is shaped by many things, not only um, you know, perceptions of masculinity, but it's certainly a factor record, according to some research. Um, and um, there's certainly evidence that men are less likely than women to wash our hands. And we know that hand washing is a key public health measure. So again, gender plays out, gender plays out um, in pandemics. And in fact, um, there are signs that uh, lockdowns and shifts in um, whether you can work from home or not have meant that some men um, have become more open to involved fathering and to greater divisions of care. Um, certainly in Australia, there's been some sign of that, but also there's ways that the pandemic has made gender inequalities worse. There's in fact increased women's domestic burdens and the unfairness that they face. So the pandemic has very much been mixed um, in terms of its impacts on gender equality. Globally, more men than women are dying um, of COVID. And again, social expectations about masculinity are one factor here. Um, now, I've got a question in the Q&A about the term toxic masculinity. I'll come back to that, Heather. That's a great question. I tend to avoid the term toxic masculinity um, because of the way it pushes buttons, but I'll come back to that question in a little while. Okay, so we've talked about drinking, we've talked about suicide, we've talked about COVID. So let's go on. I want to complicate things slightly, um, and I want to complicate things slightly by pointing out that which norm matters. You know, that man box survey identified 17 different statements about masculinity to do with about six or seven different pillars, pillars to do with toughness, pillars to do with control over women, pillars to do with emotional restriction and stoicism and so on. And the research is that some of those elements have much stronger links to men's poor health, to poor relationship outcomes than other elements. Um, so, for example, when it comes to men's violence against women and when it comes to uh, men's violence against other men, norms to do with rigid gender roles and norms to do with aggression and control are more, more influential than other, other pillars. When it comes to suicide, on the other hand, norms to do with um, stoicism, with kind of keeping your emotions in, with not showing weakness, with not showing vulnerability, they're more important. And in fact, you know, one expectation that men often face is to be strong, to be physically fit. And that can be protective against suicide. So here I'm making the point that some stereotypical masculine norms are actually good for men's health, or at least good in some contexts, such as an emphasis on strength and emphasis on physical health. And so the research on conformity to masculinity and how it links to men's poor health or men's poor relationships is getting more sophisticated getting more complicated because it's recognizing that it matters which norm we're talking about. It also matters which outcome we're talking about. So the norms that matter for some outcomes are different from the norms that matter for other outcomes. So I hope that's not getting too complicated. I'm trying to give you a sense of, you know, some of what's going on here. Okay, I want to come back to gender and I want to come back to the kind of patterns of gender we see in Australia um, and in Canada and other other countries. So um, I'm going to talk about three broad patterns, and these are certainly three broad patterns that we can see in Canada and we can see in many countries. And the first of these is to do with systemic gender inequality. Now, there's a kind of widespread belief, um, you know, in many countries, including Australia and other countries, that really we've achieved gender equality now. Feminism was important, but now it's done. We've achieved gender equality. We're in a kind of post-feminist world. But a casual glance, a casual glance at the patterns of political power, economic power, and cultural representation in Canada, in other countries, tells us that's not the case. So um, in Australia, for example, if we look at economic decision-making, women are about 
of the members of boards of our largest companies. They're 5%. Um, women are about 10% of our federal government ministers, about 17% of our, um, sorry, 10% uh, of our cabinet ministers, 17% of our government ministers, 30% um, of our parliamentarians. Um, and so there's a pattern of political and economic power. If we look at culture, look at TVs, look at movies, look at representation, we see that male characters dominate over female characters, men's voices are given more authority, are more common, and so on. Now, I'm not saying that it's an unending sea of male privilege and female disadvantage, but there certainly are patterns, patterns of female disadvantage and male privilege. And often we understand these inequalities in terms of women's disadvantage, of women's exclusion from political decision making or women's exclusion from economic power. But the flip side of that is privilege. The flip side of that is, um, is male privilege. So go back to those corporate boardrooms I mentioned. If women are 5%, well, who's the 95%? It's men. It's not just any men. It's not working class men or gay men or Muslim men or indigenous men. It tends to be highly economically privileged, um, heterosexual white men. Um, but there's certainly a pattern of, uh, of privilege there, which is in part to do with gender, it's to do with class and ethnicity and so on. Um, in fact, there's a statistic that I've seen a number of times now that there are, among the people who run companies in the US, there are more people called, more men named John than there are any women of any name. And of course, as I've said, it's not, it's not any men, it tends to be you know, a very particular group of men. Um, and if we look at how gender inequalities work, we look at how patterns of, of um, gender inequality work, well, they're sustained in part by men. They're sustained in part by the attitudes, the behaviours, the identities of many men. Not all men, hashtag not all men, but by many men. By how many men think, by how many men behave, um, by how men relate to women and so on. And I have to acknowledge this is personal. It's not that I, as some kind of, you know, um, new man, I'm somehow immune from all this. In fact, you know, that's tempting. It's tempting to say, I'm a nice guy. I'm a good guy. I've never assaulted a woman. I've never forced a woman into sex. But in fact, if I'm, if I'm honest about it, in countless ways, I have to acknowledge lots of little ways in which I've perpetuated sexism, in which I've maintained inequalities or benefited from inequalities. So I think about some of the things I've done. I, I think about I was involved in student politics early on when I was at university. And, um, you know, I and the other men in the group used to leave the women to do the washing up and the tidying up until they, you know, got sick of it and called us on it. Um, I remember with a girlfriend in my late teens, um, sometimes when she didn't want to have sex and I did want to have sex, I whined and whinged. I didn't hold a knife to her throat. I didn't have to hold a gun to her head but I was pressuring her. I was pressuring, to, pressuring her into sex. She didn't really want to have by whining, by whinging and so on. Whinging is a term for complaining. Um, I've, you know, I've been in meetings and sometimes underestimated women's achievements and skills. Um, I've looked at pornography that shows women in callous and hostile ways. In fact, I'd argue that most pornography does just that. I've sometimes not spoken up when other men have been sleazy or derogatory in how they've spoken about women. So they're just some of the examples of how I, and I think many men, have sometimes been complicit with or benefited from sexism. And that's very common. And in fact, even if we are the nicest possible guys in the world, we still benefit from the patterns of privilege I've talked about. So a classic example is to do with CVs. Um, if I send in my CV with a male name, um, you know, my name, Michael, that CV will be weighted more positively, judged um, more highly. I will be seen as more competent than the exact same CV if it had a female name. And there's research showing this where you literally send out the same CVs with male names and female names and the CVs with male names, that candidate is judged slightly more, um, slightly more highly. But that privilege, that unfair advantage that I receive just by the virtue of having a male name by being a man is often invisible. So, you know, here I am in my career, I'm a senior academic and, you know, a pretty successful academic. It would be easy to think that my achievements are simply the result of my own skill, my own hard work. And certainly I have worked hard, but one factor has to be that unearned privilege, that kind of automatic judgment that I'm more competent, uh, that I should be listened to more readily because I'm a man. 
Now, this may, may be pretty confronting, pretty, de pretty depressing, but I want to say very much, and I'll come back to this, that um, uh, men have a vital role to play in building gender equality. And in fact, many men already are playing that role. Um, so we've been talking about patterns of gender, patterns of gender inequality. I'm just going to check the chat and see what it's saying. Uh, let's have a look. Um, okay, we're all good, I think. Oh, no, four new messages. Um, Cool, okay. Um, so I've been talking about, you know, patterns of gender and I've said the first of three patterns is there is gender inequality. There's a systematic pattern of female disadvantage and male privilege. A second pattern that complicates that slightly, doesn't cancel it out, but does complicate it slightly, is that there are costs. There are costs for boys and men. Um, and men pay heavy costs, many men pay heavy costs for the patterns of gender we've got. Patterns of gender that do advantage men in some ways, but we also, we also pay costs. We pay costs in terms of our health, in terms of shallow relationships. Um, and in other words, we are limited. Men are limited. Um, we are constrained by aspects of how gender works, by patterns of gender roles and gender relations. Doesn't mean we're oppressed as men, doesn't mean that women and men are equally disadvantaged. I don't think that's the case. Um, but it does mean that men's lives are limited in important ways. And in fact, it's often been women who've noted those limitations that men face because of traditional or stereotypical masculinity. In fact, it's often been women who've been pioneers in bringing attention to problems like suicide, problems like testicular cancer, problems like the sexual assault of boys and men, and so on. The third pattern of gender, the third pattern of the gender order, is that there is diversity and change. Um, and I wanted to ask you, what do you notice about diversity first among men in Canada? What kinds of um, differences, what kinds of patterns do you see um, in terms of say different ideas about being a man or different expectations, different roles, different ways of being a man or different yeah, expectations about being a man in different communities, different contexts, different age groups in Canada. So I'll give you a few moments, moments again on chat um, to note down off the top of your head any examples you can think of of diversity and difference among boys and men in Canada. I'm just going to have a look at the chat. If someone can also confirm that you can still see the slides, um, let me know if that's no longer the case. Great, thank you. Heather, can you explain the term NGM? It's not a term I know. Ah, of course. Should have known there'd be an abbreviation. Sorry, Mark. So, so far people have talked about um, three sorts of shifts. Let's have a look. Um, so one is, uh, well, sorry, th three, kinds, three aspects of diversity and difference. One is that there, people have commented on the racism and discrimination that indigenous men may face. Um, and that's a very good example, a very powerful example, I would say, of in fact how men's lives are not all the same. Um, and Veronica has mentioned um, class as well. And if you know your feminist history, you know that um, in, you know, as the second wave of feminism um, uh, got going in the 70s and 1980s in countries including Canada and elsewhere, there was a growing critique of feminism from within feminism by black and indigenous um, women and women of color pointing to the fact that women's lives are not all the same and the issues women face as women are different from women from different ethnic and racial backgrounds, class backgrounds and so on. And there was a growing emergence of an intersectional feminist critique that recognizes that women's lives 
are structured not only by gender, but by the intersections of other forms of difference and diversity to do with race and ethnicity, to do with class, disability, sexuality, and so on. And we can apply that same analysis um, to uh, boys and men, that the lives of Indigenous men in Australia, for example, are radically different from those of non-Indigenous men. Um, the lives of gay and bisexual and trans men are different from those of um, heterosexual and cisgender men and so on. And so um, one form of diversity, in, one aspect of diversity and difference is to do with ethnicity, to do with sexuality, class and so on. But another example that was mentioned, let's have a look, uh, was in part by Todd and I think by one other person about shifts over time, that there's there have been shifts in the kinds of norms of masculinity um, that are out in the world. And certainly the research among um, men in many countries, uh, including uh, in North America and elsewhere, does show us that one norm that's breaking down, for example, is the expectation that men must be heterosexual that men must be attracted only to the other sex. Um, in fact, there's a growing sex, uh, sorry, a growing acceptance of gay and bisexual sexualities. And there's a growing blurring of gender boundaries too. Um, and there's a kind of generational difference. Um, it's slow change and uneven change. And in fact, there are signs of positive and negative change. I'll come back to that. So let's look at some of the things I wanted to um, flag. So I've talked about diversity um, among men, men and boys. And in fact, so there's diversity across nations, across cultures, diversity across ethnicity, class, and so on. But there's also distinct cultures. And I don't, I, I use the term jock here. I think that's a term that's familiar in the Canadian context. You know, when I was at school growing up, when many of you were at school growing up, there probably were diverse peer cultures. There were different groups with quite different expectations, different ways of doing gender, different ways of performing gender in them. Um, and um, so, you know, among different groups of boys in a school, among different groups of adult men, for example, you see quite diverse peer cultures, some that involve norms of respect, of consent, of uh, appreciation for sexual diversity and so on. Some peer cultures, on the other hand, are highly sexist or even misogynist or women hating, highly homophobic, racist and so on. And so there's diversity, diversity to do with other forms of social difference and also just diversity among boys and men in general. Um, okay, so let's talk about change. There have been important positive shifts in Canada, in other countries, um, increased support for gender equality, declining homophobia, I've mentioned and the blurring of gender boundaries. But there also have been negative changes too. Um, oh, someone mentioned, um, uh, Veronica mentioned men becoming more involved fathers. And I don't know what things look, look like in Canada, but in Australia, at least, there's been a really big shift in our ideals of fatherhood, in our images and our ideals of fatherhood. And more men these days say they'd like to be involved fathers. They'd like to be there at the birth, they'd be changing nappies, actively involved in nurturing children. However, the actual gap between men's and women's involvements in parenting has not closed very much. And it's actually closed to some extent because women are doing less parenting and domestic work and increasingly um, paying others to do it and, le and, and less because men are doing more or COVID's changed that to some degree. But so there's a gap between the shift in the ideals of fatherhood and shifts in the actual practice of fatherhood. But it's nevertheless an important social change, a change in our images of fathering. But I've talked about some positive shifts. I should mention some negative shifts as well. So for example, um, progress towards gender equality has slowed or stalled in many countries. Um, and in fact, COVID has made things worse in some ways. COVID has made divisions of labor worse. Um, COVID has allowed some governments to crack down on sexual and reproductive health, on women's rights, on progressive and social justice movements. Um, and there's been a shrinking of policy attention to women and gender issues in many countries. Um, there's also been backlash. There's been um, a growing rise of aggressively anti-feminist and anti-women movements online and also face to face. And there's growing concern in Australia, for example, and I think in countries such as Canada too, about young men becoming recruited into increasingly toxic and misogynist online cultures and becoming radicalised taking on kind of incel and manosphere and other anti-women, anti-feminist beliefs, 
and taking that out in violence, taking that out in online and offline abuse. So there's backlash. Um, uh, a, a real, back, you know, I think there's a serious problem of backlash and there's a problem particularly about boys and young men being recruited into that. And one other thing I wanna to mention too is to do with pornography. Um, the content of pornography has become more violent over time and violence and aggression are now routine in pornography in a way they weren't. Um, uh, depictions of strangulation or what they call choking, but strangulation of slapping, of verbal abuse, of aggressive, rough, kind of hateful sex um, are increasingly common in mainstream pornography. And I think that is playing out, particularly among boys and men in increased rates of forced anal sex, of strangulation and of other forms of sexual coercion. So there's good news, but there's also bad news. Okay, let's move on. Um, so here's what I've said about gender so far. Gender means men as much as it does women. Masculinity refers to the meanings we give to being male, the social organization of men's lives. Um, and I've given you some basic points about how to understand gender. Um, there's gender inequality, there's costs to men and boys and men's lives are limited by conformity to masculinity in important ways. Um, and there's also diversity and change. So I wanna move now um, to the question of boys and men's roles in promoting gender equality, um, to the positive roles that boys and men can play. And so I wanna ask you, do you know at least one man? Do you know at least one man who is playing um, up some positive role? One man who consistently treats the women and girls in his lives with respect and care? Assuming you do know that man, one man, and I hope it's not all the same man, I hope you know, um, you know plenty of those men. Um, so in fact, someone's commented, we're lucky enough at Next Gen Men to know many such men. That's lovely, that's very inspiring. Um, so the question I have at the bottom of that slide is, how did those men come to exist in the world? What inspires those men? What shapes those men's lives so that they come to a commitment, a commitment to building gender equality? What are some of the factors, in other words, that shape um, the commitments that some men do have, in fact, a growing number of men have in next gen men and elsewhere um, in being advocates for gender equality? Lana Wells did some research on this, says Veronica. Indeed, Lana Wells is a star. I am a great admirer of Lana Wells and I had the privilege of working with her when I was in Alberta two years ago. Um, and uh, yeah, as well, uh, elsewhere, you know, I'm very impressed by her work. So Barry mentions past experiences and the desire to change themselves and others. Barry, can you say more about those past experiences and what kinds of experiences might shape um, that commitment to gender equality? And Rogers mentioned a kind of an orientation, an education. So being educated is, a, is an experience and a willingness to seek out truths and others. Um, Veronica's mentioned sensitizing experiences, and that's absolutely central. Um, yeah, so um, there's also research by Casey and colleagues, Aaron Casey and colleagues in the US, that sensitizing experiences, particularly, um, so Veronica's mentioned hearing about and learning about other forms of social injustice like racism. Research in the US found that being sensitized to women's experience was central as well. That some men came to men's anti-violence advocacy because they heard about women's experiences of assault, women's experiences of abuse, and realized just how many women around them had suffered these things and came to a kind of passionate commitment to try to stop that from happening. Um, Barry mentioned childhood abuse, not fitting in. They're really interesting. So some men come to a commitment to these issues because of their own experiences of victimization. Some men come to these issues because of a sense of distance, a sense of distance from traditional masculinity. Um, exposure to violence, witnessing violence. Um, uh, Veronica's mentioned, um, Rogers mentioned, again, a form of social justice involvement, being involved in Black Lives Matter awareness groups and so on. So between us, I think we've traced a number of really important trajectories or pathways or influences to a commitment to gender equality. So personal orientations, you know, a, a willingness to learn, a sensitivity to injustice, a compassion for others, a distance from traditional masculinity, sensitizing experiences um, of racism and injustice, 
um, listening to women's experience, being exposed to social justice activism and ideals. Um, yeah, other things as well. So um, yeah, look, that's, you've done a great job of doing this. Um, and I very much want to say that men have a vital role to play, and I, I think I'm probably preaching to the choir here, um, but men have a vital role to play in, um, in uh, building gender justice. And, you know, think about, think about what I said before about the act like a man box, about the man box or the act like a man box. Um, you know, written on the message, written on the sides of the box are messages like boys should be, you know, boys shouldn't cry. Um, men are the lords of their household. Violence is acceptable. Gay is bad. We should always be tough. Women are second class citizens. Now, those, those messages are harmful for women. They're harmful for gay and other men. And they're limiting for men themselves. And I'd argue very much that feminism, a movement for gender equality, a movement for gender justice, that feminism frees men from that. Feminism argues that gender roles and gender relations are the product of society, not biology. So feminism is anti-sexist. It's not anti-male, it's anti-sexist. And it calls for gender equality, for gender justice, for gender diversity. And it's good for men. Um, in fact, feminism, I'd argue, progress towards gender equality is good for men, good in various ways. Think about personal well-being, for example. What kind of life um, do men themselves want? Men's well-being is limited by narrow constructions of masculinity. Men who think that being a man is about being 10 feet tall, being bulletproof, pay a cost for that. Second, there's our relational interests. What kinds of lives do men want for their daughters, for their wives, for the women and girls around them? Um, when those women and girls benefit, men benefit too. Men in general are in social relationships with women and girls. And the quality of men's lives depends in part on the lives of those around them. So some, you know, one reason why some men come to these issues is a concern for the women and girls around them. Now, ideally, of course, that's not where it stops. Ideally, that concern is translated into a fundamental respect for the human rights, the well-being of women and girls in general, not just the women and girls in their own lives. We know from the research that feminism is good for men's relationships that men who are more gender egalitarian, more, you know, have stronger beliefs in equality and so on, have richer, more trusting relationships with women, sexual relationships with women. They also have richer sex lives. They're better at consent. They're more committed to consent. They tend to be going out with feminist women who themselves are committed to their own pleasure, committed to the trust and intimacy and equality in their relationships. We know that feminism is good for men's friendships. It creates room for friendships with other men that are more open, more trusting, more intimate and supportive. And feminism is good for men's working lives. It gives men choices, um, choices about being involved in parenting, ideally with you know, good parental leaves backing that up, um, rather than the expectation that men must always be the breadwinner, the one who brings home the money. And finally, men's collective interests in communities benefit as well. Gender equality is good for our communities. It benefits the communities in which men live. Our communities benefit from more flexible divisions of labor. Our communities benefit from improvements in women's health. Our communities benefit from lower levels of violence against women and indeed lower levels of violence between men ourselves. So gender equality is good for men. Um, now, part of what I'm doing here is modelling the kind of pitch that you might offer, um, you know, to a group of 16-year-old boys or a group of men in a community. This may be a pitch that you're very familiar with yourself. You may have a better version of this pitch, but I sort of wanted to, you know, give you an example of making the pitch to boys and men of how gender equality is in their interests. So, um, so gender equality is good for men. Um, is it bad for men? I don't think so. But there are some things that some men will have to give up. Um, so to sort of back up a bit, why, you know, why should men pr promote gender equality? Why should men change? The primary reason should be an ethical reason or a political reason. It's the right thing to do. Men, myself included, receive unfair and unjust privileges. And we have an ethical obligation to address that privilege, to make things fair. But second, it's in our interest. It's in our interest to change. We will benefit from supporting feminism and advancing towards gender equality. Um, and I've talked about the reasons how men will benefit. So men will gain, but there are some things that some men will lose. So if we go back to that corporate boardroom, that corporate boardroom where men are 95% of the people in the room, well, 
if it's fair, if people are being promoted honestly on the basis of merit, some of those men are going to have to leave the room. Some of those men, um, uh, you know, are going to have to step out. There's going to have to be a greater sharing of social and economic power. So what will men lose? Well, men will lose unfair privileges and unfair, you know, unearned advantages. So when I send off my CV with a male name, it will no longer be judged as better than a CV with a female name. Um, when I'm in a relationship, I'll no longer be able to assume that my sexual needs come first, that we have sex when I want to have sex and we have the kind of sex I want to have. Instead, it will be a negotiation. It will be a kind of open-ended, um, respectful um, negotiation of what we would each like to do. Uh, I won't be able to get away with not doing the housework, with watching TV for a couple of hours each night while my female partner does the washing up and manages the kids' school uniforms and so on. I won't be able to do those things. So I'll lose some things, but, I, but that's not a hardship. In fact, it's about what's fair. It's about what's right. I'm just gonna see if there's a question in chat. Um, men identifying as feminists versus pro-feminists. Um, okay, I'm gonna tackle this one um, in, in, in a one minute go. Um, so uh, I think it's great when men advocate for feminism and support feminism. And in a sense, I care far less whether, whether men call ourselves feminists or not, than whether we advocate for and support feminism. Having said that, I do have some reservations around men using the term feminist for ourselves. I tend to prefer that men use terms like pro-feminist or anti-sexist. And my reservation is that in some ways, in some instances, it can represent a kind of colonizing, um, uh, a sense that men can know women's experience fully as well as women know it themselves and are speaking for women. So I, pre I prefer to acknowledge that, you know, as a man, I can't know what it's like to live as a woman. As a man, I have to be conscious of the kind of politics of who speaks, of who represents women and so on. And part of, it, part of that is using the term pro-feminist rather than feminist. But, um, you know, I've seen really... Uh, strongly radical feminist writers and speakers say, absolutely, men can call themselves feminists. So, you know, there's disagreement out there, but for myself, I tend to use terms like pro-feminist. Um, okay, let's come back to this. So let's look, let's look at the engaging men field. There's this growing body of research, um, sorry, this growing body of practice engaging men, engaging men in preventing violence against women, in building sexual and reproductive health, um, parenting and families and so on. I see this coming about backlash too. I'll come back to that in a moment. And um, there's, you know, the engaging men field is well established. It's well established internationally through networks like Men Engage. It's established in Canada and other countries through what look like really great initiatives like Next Gen Men and a whole range of other initiatives. Um, and importantly, it shows evidence of effectiveness. It, um, if done well, and that's a big if, well-designed interventions can make change. They can make change in the attitudes that we know feed into violence, feed into inequality, feed into sexism, and can make change in behaviours, in sexist behaviour, in violence and so on. There's a body of research showing impact, showing evidence. Certainly some interventions don't work, some interventions even make things worse, but we know that well-designed interventions can shift attitudes and behaviours among men. Um, now, I'm not going to give you a systematic account of the field. I've written elsewhere about that, but I'm just giving you a taste for some of that. So if we think about what it actually looks like, well, one thing to recognise is there's a spectrum of forms of intervention. Much, um, many interventions um, take place at the, at the second level there, the level of community education involving face-to-face -face education, or increasingly now in the days of COVID, online education. Um, another stream of intervention at that level involves communications and social marketing. There's been less intervention at some of the higher levels. You can see this goes from micro to macro down the bottom. And there's been less effort to engage um, male policymakers and male power holders. There's been less effort focused directly on law and policy or on changing institutions, changing the way that sporting institutions work or religious institutions work. There's been more work at the more micro levels, face-to-face -face education, social marketing, but that is shifting. Um, so in terms of the field, in terms of the work engaging men and boys in Canada, for example, what's good about it? What's good about this work? 
and what is bad about it? What troubles you about this work? What concerns you about this growing field of practice engaging men and boys? So what do you see as positive and what do you see as troubling? Again, I'm going to chat and let's see if people have any comments. Okay, we've got a few comments in there. So um, some of the comments are about the um, character of the work itself, that it's growing. So Mark, um, um, I recall Mark that you're not Heather, but Mark, um, that Mark comments that the work itself is increasing. There's more support, there's greater education. You know, so in other words, the, the body of work engaging men and boys is itself expanding. And that's certainly my impression as well. Um, and there's a second stream of comments um, to do with the impact of this work, that um, it's creating freedom for boys to be themselves, it's creating ripples of change and so on. That's, so that's really encouraging. Mark's commented on one thing that concerns him, which is men doing this work for self-serving purposes. Mark, I'd love to hear more about that because I've made the argument that in fact, it's in men's interest to be involved in this kind of work and that men will benefit from this. And I'm sure that um, men in next gen men do report some positive impacts for themselves of this work, but you're saying something different from that. You're talking about being self-serving, about a, a kind of problematic version of being in it for your own interest. Can you say a bit more about that? And a couple of people have mentioned pushback and resistance. Um, so pushback from friends and family and society, uh, that came from Roger, and there's a growing body of research on efforts to engage men and boys around the world, and one of the challenges that's been documented is, you know, you work with boys and men and they take on much healthier and more equitable forms of masculinity, and then they go back to their households or they'll go back to their families and their communities and they're criticised, oh, have you cut off your penis now? Have you abandoned your manhood? In other words, there's a policing of masculinity that we know that goes on. It comes particularly from other men, but it also comes from women. And they can face challenges and pushback. That's one form of resistance. A second form of resistance is where you get explicitly kind of anti-feminist resistance, where you get a growing backlash by so-called men's rights and father's rights groups who push back against efforts to address men's violence or other, you know, other issues of gender equality. They attack your campaigns, they attack women's groups, they take out legal action, they um, abuse you on social media and so on. I'm pretty familiar with some of the abuse and attacks that go on. Um, now Heather's commented, uh, sorry, damn it, Mark has commented, um, some people speak about pe uh, men calling themselves feminists for the wrong reasons. They're controlling and try to manipulate women. Look, absolutely that happens. Um, uh, that happens where men use the term feminist for themselves um, in ways that are really about trying to um, convince women that they're good guys when their motives in fact are more predatory, their motives are more merc uh, mercenary and they've not done the work, they've not tried to do the work of changing their own lives and changing their own practices. Now, um, we shouldn't be surprised that there may be a gap between what men aspire to be and what men actually are, because we're constantly invited back into patriarchy. We're constantly invited back into sexist ways of treating women. And, um, you know, socialization runs deep, but that's not what um, Mark and others are talking about. They're talking about the more cynical or um, manipulative use of an apparent feminist appearance to, you know, get women into bed or to persuade women that you're, you know, you're one of the good guys. And yeah, that's absolutely troubling. There've also been in Australia as elsewhere, some high profile examples of men who've been prominent advocates for feminism, um, who then it comes out, in fact, had behaved in abusive and coercive ways themselves. And that is really dismaying and troubling. Um, and yeah. So, and we have, to, we have to have good ways of dealing with that. In fact, one of the pieces I've written on XY Online, the website I run, is about precisely that issue of what to do when pro-feminist speakers or pro-feminist advocates are alleged to have committed abuse or harassment. And in fact, I've written it for those men themselves, what those men themselves need to do. 
and secondly, what the people around them, advocates, friends, and others need to do. But yeah, as, as Veronica comments, it's very damaging to the work. Okay, so I'm gonna talk briefly about three principles, three principles of this work. Um, and I'm assuming my slides are still visible. I'll just move that back to the other screen. Um, so one is a really fundamental principle about being gender transformative. And the phrase gender transformative is increasingly common um, in this work. I'm just going to see what's in, sorry, I'm just going to go back to chat and see what's coming up. I can just see some more stuff coming up there. Chat, XY Online, indeed. Uh, yeah, and there's a wealth of resources on XY Online. In fact, the last slide of this slide presentation, which you'll get, um, points you to a wealth of resources on engaging men, on a curricula, on dilemmas over this work. And it also points you to my book. And I've written a book called Engaging Men and Boys in Violence Prevention. But whether or not you're addressing violence in your own work, it's relevant for any kind of work engaging men and boys. And the book is free. Don't tell my publisher, they wouldn't be happy about that. But I've made the PDF of the book free from that website. Okay, so let's talk about some basic principles of engaging men. One is that our work has to be gender transformative. And this phrase gender transformative is increasingly visible, um, particularly in, in, in the international work, but also at, elsewhere. What it means is it has to aim to transform gender. It has to transform gender roles and gender relations towards equality, towards gender justice. Now you might say, well, that sounds like a you know, feminist, aren't you just saying feminist? And in a sense, I am. What's interesting is that gender transformative as a phrase has a prominence, whereas feminist you know, sometimes is less uh, less visible. And that, that may be a politically pragmatic choice, I'm not sure. Um, and so if we think about what gender transformative means, um, I'll talk briefly about the, the next two in um, a little while, but if we think briefly about what gender transformative means, it means, for example, addressing the gender drivers of the problem. Here I've referred to violence against women, which is the area on which I often work. And there's a great um, continuum we can think of in terms of different ways of working with men. You might be gender exploitative. Gender exploitative would be to exploit and in fact potentially worsen stereotypical gender roles and gender inequalities. And some people argue, for example, that campaigns that say real men, real men don't use violence, real men are nurses, or you know, real men take care of their health, that campaigns that appeal, that appeal to those stereotypical notions of masculinity, in fact, they exploit gender, they make things worse. Gender bind programs don't pay any attention to gender, they don't make reference to men or women or gender roles or notions of gender. Gender sensitive programs consider women's and men's specific needs, but don't address gender inequalities. Whereas gender transformative, which is what I think the desirable end of the continuum is, gender transformative programs and interventions try to create more gender equitable roles and relations. So to be gender, gender transformative is not only to pay attention to gender, but to try to transform gender, to build gender equality, to build nonviolence and so on. And um, so what does that look like in practice? Well, that means, for example, that your curricula, the curricula of your program, the content of your marketing campaign, the, the materials you use need to address gender. They need to try to engage men and boys in critical reflections on men and masculinity, on the messages they've been taught and so on. And as part of that, they need to have an explicit attention to power and privilege, to kind of gender, power and privilege. They're unlikely to shift the kinds of things we know are part of the problem without doing that. So you need gender transformative content. You also need gender transformative processes, processes that get men talking, for example, get men critically reflecting about masculinities and gender, and that find effective ways, they can be creative or innovative ways of building men's support for gender equality. And in fact, there's a growing body of um, experience and to some extent evidence on how to do that, on how to foster men's commitment to gender equality. Uh, processes like having women listen, sorry, having men listen to women's experience or having men document the patterns of gender inequality or, um, you know, other kinds of um, creative strategies. Now, the last thing I want to say in this presentation, we've been going for a while and I've talked at you for a while, um, is about um, messaging. I want to spend a little bit of time on messaging. I don't know to what extent the people in, on, this, um, on this Zoom are involved in communications and social marketing. But there's been what I think of as some very innovative work in Australia on messaging for healthy masculinity. I'm just going to check the chat and see what's there too. 
Um, great. So next gen men uses the language of gender transformative itself and is very much um, focused on that. Um, great. Okay. And the slides are still visible. That's excellent. Cool. So um, Vic Health, which is a, a significant health promotion body in Australia, um, did some work on the kinds of messaging that will move men and women towards more healthy, equitable understandings of men and masculinity. And as part of that, it did a survey. It surveyed men and women in Australia about their attitudes towards masculinity, it used a whole series of statements that you could agree or disagree with. And it also did some dial testing where VicHealth crafted five different 30 second messages and played them to the participants in the survey, you know, uh, individually. And participants had a dial where they could agree or disagree with the message as it played. And you saw this pattern of agreement for each of the five messages. And VicHealth mapped those patterns of agreement for three groups of people. The supporters, people who are already on side, who already support gender equality, who've got kind of feminist views, basically. The persuadables, who are the people in the middle, it was about half the sample, who kind of, you know, are a bit unsure, a bit in the middle about where, what they think about masculinity, what they think about gender and feminism and so on. And also then the opposition, which was about a quarter of the sample, who are hostile to feminism. They may not be rabidly anti-feminist, about 5% of them are, but 25% of the Australian population were kind of broadly hostile to um, to feminist views. They see gender as biologically determined. They see gen traditional gender roles as desirable, or natural, and so on. And so this work generated a whole lot of really valuable data on what people in Australia think about masculinity, but it also generated something else. It generated some data on what kinds of messaging works or doesn't work in shifting people towards more positive or feminist or gender transformative views of masculinity. One thing um, that research found, for example, is that if you make reference to opposition messages, like the notion of a war on men, if you make reference to the notion of a war on men, even if you're criticizing it or debunking it, you actually can entrench that perspective. The same is true for biologically essentialist or determinist views, you know, the idea that boys will be boys or men are just naturally violent or men are just naturally less capable than women of caring for children, if you make reference to those views, even to debunk them or rebut them, this research showed that in fact, it intensified people's support for those views. And the same was true of myths and facts approaches, that particularly if you present the myth first, people that actually can reinforce the myth and do harm. It can strengthen regressive frames, you know, frames, ways of understanding the issue. Likewise, the term masculinity turns out to be a problem. And this comes back to, I think it was Heather's question about the phrase toxic masculinity. Some people don't understand the term masculinity to refer to a range of different ideas about being a man, where toxic masculinity refers to one particular toxic version of that. Instead, they understand masculinity as basically synonymous with men, as referring to all men. So if you start criticizing masculinity or criticizing tos toxic masculinity, some people hear that as saying all men are a problem, all men are toxic. So again, there are risks in using that language. Um, likewise, there are, there's a problem in framing men and women as equally constrained as gender. The main problem there is that it's simply not true. Um, there are many, many ways in which women's lives are more constrained by gender than men's. Um, and appeals to real men, other gender exploitative frames also are problematic. So let's look at what actually is useful. It's useful to craft messages that appeal to supporters, that appeal to the people you already have on side, but also shift persuadables, shift the people who are open to progressive points of view. And the research that I'm describing, it found, for example, that persuadables present an opposition message to them. There's now a war on men or men are just naturally violent. And they agreed with it. They were quite malleable and they would agree with these quite conservative messages but present a progressive message, a more feminist message, men have a role in stopping gender equality, or boys need role models of both sexes, messages like that. And they agreed with those, they shifted towards those. And some members of the opposition did too, or at least they didn't get worse. So um, 
you know, the sort of take home from this is avoid messages um, that uh, appeal to both appoint opponents and persuadables um, and that move persuadables towards more aggressive views. So four concrete tips, and this come from a healthy messaging guide that Vic Health has written. And again, I've put a link to that um, in the back of, the, of this presentation. So one message, one tip is don't pander to the vocal minority. Resist the temptation to use traditionally masculine language, real men, or to do myth busting. Instead, tell the progressive story to the vast majority of people who are persuadable. The 5% or the 10% who are deeply hostile to your message, they're not gonna listen anyway but others will shift. The persuadables, the more movable middle, they will shift. So don't use a message like, men are not naturally violent. They have been taught to use violence because that gives ground, that may reinforce the idea that men are naturally violent. Instead, say men have been taught to use violence. Don't say real men show their emotions, say it's healthy to show your emotions. Um, in fact, I've got a slide that gives you this language. So um, uh, even though this isn't, there's some of the examples I'm giving you aren't on this slide, they are on another slide in a moment. Um, dox men, don't box men in. When you're explaining um, why masculinity is a problem, frame it in terms of gender stereotypes that constrain men or limit men. Um, and when you're talking about the solution, our, the research I've described says that it's more productive to frame that as freedom from gender stereotypes. Freedom from gender stereotypes altogether rather than necessarily new or better forms of masculinity. And that's interesting because the phrase healthy masculinity is increasingly visible in this work. There's some evidence that that may be less effective than talking about freedom from gender stereotypes altogether. So for example, um, testing different messages, we found it was more effective to say, it's time we freed men from outdated masculine stereotypes rather than to talk about redesigning masculinity. Um, Better to say men shouldn't be shackled, men shouldn't be shackled to any gender stereotype, rather than saying there's more than one way to be a man. Um, be solution focused, spend more time talking about men's, men's uh, role in the solution, less time talking about men's role in the problem. And there's a real problem here of defensiveness, of course. So for example, rather than saying all men do things that contribute to a culture of violence against women, Better to say there are things all men can do to end the culture of violence against women. Um, okay, uh, use the power of social norming. It's dangerous to imply that traditional masculine stereotypes are widespread, are dominant among men. In fact, point out, at least from our research, that most people think traditional masculine stereotypes are harmful. Most people think they're harmful. And most people think men should be freed from them. Um, so, um, so for example, um, you know, rather than saying challenging these out outdated ideas of masculinity is, is difficult because they're so embedded in our culture, that can just reinforce the idea that everyone else thinks that men should be traditionally masculine. Instead say, you know, many Canadians don't agree with these outdated attitudes and are ready for change. Say most people in Canada want, want men to be respectful, caring and so on and so on. Um, so I, you probably can't read this, but this, these slides give you examples of the kind of from and to, what to avoid, what to um, endorse. Now you may think, look, it's more complicated or you're really not sure, but at least there's some research evidence that the messages in green, the messages with the green next to them, um, are more effective. That, in other words, some ways of framing our messaging about masculinity, about the need for change, will be more effective at creating positive change. Okay, I want to end, um, I won't go through all of this in detail because I'm at 90 minutes as it is. Um, that slide points to just to some further resources on educating men and boys. And it sounds like in Next Gen Men and in some of the other initiatives um, that are going on, um, that there's some really good, effective ways of engaging men and boys happening. Someone's just reminded me that it's 4 a.m. Don't tell me that. I don't want to think about the fact it's 5.30 now, 5.30 in the morning. Sun's not up yet. It's still dark outside, but anyway. Look, um, I want to end with, end with these three broad points, three broad points for what we need to do. We need to highlight the harms, highlight the harms of the man box or a patriarchal masculinity. I wouldn't call it patriarchal masculinity in a communications campaign aimed at Canadians in general, but you know, in among these circles, I think I can safely call it patriarchal masculinity. 
let's raise awareness of the harms of the man box. And in doing so, let's avoid a focus only on harms to men. We have to address how masculinity is also tied to unfair forms of privilege, to harms um, enacted on women, on children, and on particular groups of men, gay men, trans men, and so on. Let's weaken the, grip, weaken the grip of patriarchal masculinity. And part of that is highlighting the gap between those social norms, what many men are, feel they're told by society, what they think they are expected by society, and what they themselves believe. So the survey I mentioned in the US, the survey in Australia found a gap, a gap between men's own endorsement of those ideals and what they're receiving from society. And men in general often overestimate other men's support for these traditional masculine norms. So we need to narrow that gap. Um, so we also need to turn up volume, turn up the volume on the fact of diversity, the fact of diversity and change among men. We need to highlight the fact that there's non-conformity, there's active resistance to stereotypical masculine norms. And we need to popularize alternatives to that. And I'll come back to that in a moment. We need to engage boys and men in critical conversations about masculinity, whether that's face to face or through innovative marketing campaigns and so on. We also need to be a bit assertive, a bit, uh, there's an Australian word stroppy. It means to be kind of uh, not quite aggressive, but you know, more than assertive. We need to challenge the sources of patriarchal masculinity the shock jocks and broadcasters, the religious figures, the political leaders who are trying to reinforce patriarchal masculinity. And we need to um, foster alternative voices. Last thing I wanna say, I have used the phrase healthy masculinity, but I think there's a broader language we can also consider um, for how to foster healthy, equitable, progressive ways of being among boys and men. We need to foster alternatives. And the, you know, the basic rule here is boys and men can't be what they cannot see. So we need to foster visible alternatives to traditional patriarchal masculinity. Um, and there's kind of a question about what we call it. Uh, well, actually, before we get to what do we call it, we have to figure out, well, what does it actually look like? And so it has to be based on equality, on nonviolence and respect. It should celebrate qualities like empathy, like nurturance, um, and so on. And then there's the question of, well, what do we call it? Do we call it healthy? Do we call it feminist? Do we call it gender equitable? Do we call it democratic? Um, and that's the discussion point we'll finish on. So we'll come back to that in a moment. But whatever we call it, it has to be feminist. It has to be, it has to be principled or ethical. It has to be based on equality. You know, there's no point encouraging a new masculinity that still involves um, being dominant towards particular groups or excluding women or um, so on. Um, someone's just written, we've, um, Veronica's um, notes, we've used positive masculinities for a long time. Indeed, um, that's, you know, that should be up on my list. So whatever vision we have, it has to be feminist, you know, ethical, nonviolent and so on. It has to be diverse and multiple. And I've written about this in greater length um, in a piece that's also on that Vic Health site. Um, there's no point constructing a new man box, a new narrow set of norms for what it means to be a man. We need to create room for um, you know, diverse constituencies of men, men who wake up next to their male partners, men who um, pray facing Mecca, men who indeed didn't start life as boys, but as girls. We need visions of um, you know, what we want that are diverse, that are multiple. And finally, it has to be non-essentialist whatever our positive vision of being in the world, it can't be one that's available only to people with penises. It can't be available only to people who are men or identify as men. Um, that would be to kind of reproduce essentialism. So, you know, reproduce a kind of biological determinism. So our visions of a positive or an open or a healthy masculinity or way of being has to be feminist, has to be diverse, has to be non-essentialist. So, um, the work you're doing in Canada, the work that, um, um, you know, that is being done in Australia and countries around the world, it's really part of uh, what is a significant momentum, a significant momentum in addressing boys and men, in challenging sexism and gender inequality, in building a better world. People are talking, parents are talking to some extent about how they raise our sons. People are talking in the media and elsewhere about the harmful aspects of traditional masculinity. 
we have a really vital opportunity, an opportunity to shape those conversations, to build on those conversations. We have a profound opportunity to build healthier, fairer lives for men, for women, for everybody. So join me in doing that. Let's do that. Thank you. So I'm stopping now. I'm not quite out of energy. Um, let's, um, let's end with some final, um, Danica, if we've got time, let's see if there's any final questions or comments. Um, there are some further slides about toxic masculinity, but I don't want to run through those now. There are also some further slides about resistance and backlash. I think two slides talking about effective ways to deal with resistance and backlash, but I've probably exhausted, exhausted you by talking at you, hopefully, coherently and sensibly for some time, and you may be flagging. Anyway, and it's your Sunday, I believe, Sunday afternoon. Um, Danica. We have quite a few questions here um, from Roger. Why are men who are promiscuous considered studs while women are, who are promiscuous considered sluts? Yeah, look, that's a great example, Roger, of the sexual double standard. A double standard, that is two standards, um, one for men, one for women, where women's sexuality is policed and judged much more strongly, much more tightly than men's. And men receive, um, men aren't judged. In fact, men can receive status as studs or players or gigolos or Casanovas or a hundred other terms um, for sexual activity in a way that women simply don't. And women lose reputation. I think that's an expression of sexism, you know, plain and simple. And that sexual double standard has narrowed slightly, you know, it's closed slightly. Men are slightly more nervous than they used to be about being perceived as sleazy or creepy, but I think it's still a very powerful policing of women's and girls' lives. And it's a good example of persistent gender inequalities. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, we have a question from Rick. Um, can you speak to the correlation between childhood trauma of boys and its correlation to being a violent prone as men? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, witnessing or experiencing violence as a child, particularly if you're a boy, is a risk factor for adult perpetration. That is comparing the groups of children who've witnessed or experienced domestic violence and the groups of children who haven't. Among boys in the first group, um, they're more likely to perpetrate violence as adults than boys in the second group. Having said that, it's not inevitable, it's not deterministic by any means. It's a risk factor, which means it increases the likelihood, but it doesn't make it inevitable. And there are plenty of boys and boys and young men who, having seen their mothers assaulted by their fathers, or indeed, you know, the reverse, grow up with a passionate commitment to never behaving that way themselves and a passionate commitment to ending that violence. Um, but yes, it's a risk factor, and that's one reason why early intervention among the boys and young men who are living with violence in their households is an important prevention strategy. Wonderful. Everybody loves early intervention, right? <laughs> um, in, your in an article you wrote in January 2021, men preventing men's violence against women, what we know, what we've done, and what to do next. You talk about the unfortunately still small evidence base in the field of preventing men's violence. From what you know now of this evidence base, what are some of the typical features of initiatives that have been proven to be effective? <laughs> That's such a huge question. And it depends <laughs> on the initiative. Look, it's a great question. It's a really good question. You know, um, I talked about um, three uh, features in a slide. I, I didn't flag them that clearly, but it has to be gender transformative. It has to explicitly address gender. It has to be engaging. Um, you know, it doesn't matter how good your theory is if um, it's not engaging for the men in the room or the people who are the audience of the social marketing campaign. So it has to somehow be interesting, be perceived as relevant and so on. And then the third criteria I mentioned is about being inclusive. Another way of thinking about that is about being intersectional. It has to speak to the specifics of that community, that cohort of what's going on. Beyond that, then, there's a whole lot of issues of design. So in face-to-face -face work, for example, we know that multi-session um, programs involving interactive and participatory teaching and learning strategies are far more effective than a one-off lecture, a one-off talk to a group of people. When it comes to communication and social marketing, we know that um, materials that involve messengers, role models, 
that the target audience will identify with and messages that are meaningful, that are engaging for them are much more likely to be effective. Um, in community mobilization, which is a, ne a neglected strategy, but a very important strategy, we know that mobilizing men is more likely to be effective if it involves community ownership, if it's done in, uh, in partnership with women and women's groups and so on. Um, and, you know, I don't want to sound too self-promotional, but in my book, Engaging Men and Boys in Violence Prevention, I talk about different strategies, face-to-face -face education, community mobilization, and try to identify the features of effective practice for each. And that's, um, you can apply those whether, you're, whether or not you're working on violence, whether you're working on other issues. I've tried to say, here's what we know works and doesn't work. And also here are some of the questions we don't know. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, is my sheen, uh, sorry, screen still sharing? It is, yes. Yeah, so this is the slide I mentioned that really directs you to um, a bunch of this stuff, um, including that work on healthy messaging. Um, I'm in a kind of, you know, pretty enthusiastic, some would say obsessive collector of resources and materials, um, including academic work, but also, you know, very practical curricula and so on. And so I've been very, I think, very diligent at collecting existing curricula on working with men and boys, discussions of, you know, some of the dilemmas. You know, what does it mean for men and boys to be accountable to women? What do we do about when there's debate among women's groups and feminists over these issues? Um, how do we address um, racism and homophobia in our work? You know, all kinds of things. And so I've really tried hard to collect what are the best resources out there and put them all together free, um, you know, in one place. Awesome, awesome. Um, I think we are out of questions. Looking in the chat box. Um, well, I'd just like to thank you so much for your time, Michael. But this was absolutely fantastic. You really gave us a nice well-rounded view of masculinity and from um, on behalf of plaintiffs with the back and extra men and Cirque, we thank you so much for your time again especially at four in the morning on a monday morning um someone's asked about a copy of the last slide my understanding Danaki, is that um you will make the slides available you'll you'll either email them out or put them up on a website i'd be very happy for for that you know that's the whole point for me is to kind of make resources available you betcha. We will send that out. We, will, we can put it on our website as well. We can send it out uh, via email as well. Yeah. Um, just to give participants in the audience um, a little um, bit of heads up. We are, our next event is March 28th uh, with Jake Sticka, Gender Equity and Men's Mental Health in the Workplace. We would love to see you there if you have time. Um, any last word, Michael? Uh, yes, look, it's been a real pleasure to be part of this. Um, and I can see from the chat and from the chat and Q&A that there's a lot of really smart thinking out there. It looks to me like there's some really great work going on um, among the people who are participating in this. I'm sorry that we can't, you know, be face to face. And I'd love to hear about the richness of that work. And I did get some sense of that when I was in um, Alberta two years ago. But look, thank you for joining me on your Sunday afternoon. Um, you'll, you'll see the slides. And one of the things that's on the slides is my email address. Again, that's there deliberately. Feel free to write to me and say, but what about this issue? Or do you have resources on that issue? I'd be very happy to resource you to any, any extent I can. So thank you again for taking the time to um, participate in this. Awesome, thank you so much. I hope everybody enjoys the rest of Sunday, Monday, or whatever day it is in their um, community. Okay, Fantastic. thanks. Okay. See you guys. See you folks.